Welcome to episode 32 of the Serious About Security podcast for March 26, 2013. Brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined today by Keith Watson and Mike Hill. Yes, and I believe I have the uh, first article of the day. Um, it is on Brian Krebs of uh, Krebs on Security being swatted. Um, for those who may not know, swatting is the act of uh, placing a phone call, uh, typically from a spoofed number, uh, to authorities uh, where you file a false report and you try to invoke police action. Um, in Brian's case, this occurred on uh, Thursday, March 14th. Um, he had just written a story a few days earlier about um, SSSDOB.RU, um, basically a, a site that sells access to social security numbers. And um, a, a few days after publishing his his story, uh, he noticed that his uh, website was being attacked that, that same day, that Thursday, and uh, a lot of denial of service attacks were occurring. Um, so he, he you know, kind of went about his business, and uh, later that day, he was kind of cleaning up his house. He expected company, and he could hear his phone ringing upstairs, uh, but he's like, I'll check it later, you know, get get a voicemail or something like that, and uh, uh, apparently, he went to open the front door. He had some tape where Christmas lights had been, and uh, uh, when he pulled up that tape, he was uh, greeted with uh, police officers with guns pointed at him, telling him to, to raise his hands, you know, put his hands in the air, and, you know, uh, they they, they cuffed him and uh, uh, asked to look into his house, and, and they quickly, you know, they kind of quickly figured out that uh, uh, this was a result of, of being uh, swatted. Uh, it turns out the uh, the uh, hackers that performed this swat on uh, Brian had placed a phone call, and it reported that Russians had broken into uh, to Brian's house and shot Brian's wife. Uh, so the, the police showed up uh, quickly uh, with guns raised and uh, uh, were prepared to take action if that were the case. Um, however, uh, it, it, fortunately, everything turned out well for Brian and his family. Uh, no one was harmed in the swatting, uh, but I'm sure it was a bit of a, a frightening event for him. And um, Brian has been posting updates to his blog uh, as, as he learns more information. And uh, an update he posted was he's kind of following the, the uh, breadcrumbs trail here. And it turns out that there may even be a connection in this uh, story to uh, the hacker phobia. Um, phobia is the hacker that uh, Matt Honan spoke to uh, last year of, of Wired. And uh, you may remember that Matt Honan is the one that had kind of his um, whole, uh, all of his Apple devices wiped remotely uh, because hackers wanted to get a hold of his Twitter handle. So um, I thought this was a, a very interesting story. I, I'll be honest, I never heard of the, the term swatting before reading this story. Um, I didn't realize it was uh, something that could be done or that, that folks were doing it. And, and it sounds like it's relatively easy to pull off because it's easy to spoof caller ID numbers. So uh, um, Brian, unfortunately, became a victim of it. And uh, just wanted to get your guys' thought and see what, what you thought about this. Well, it seems that he is, based on his investigative reporting, has made a few enemies, if you will. Um, if you look at the Ars Technica article, it kind of lists off some of those, like shutting down a California hosting service that uh, hosted a lot of spammers and child pornographers and done damage to the Russian business network, and a variety of other things, malware exploit kits and credit card reports, denial of service attacks and services. Um, so he's got a few enemies probably, which is sad because he is, he's a reporter. He's not government official or anything like that. He's just reporting what's going on. Um, but sadly, there are people who really would rather everybody else not know about it, obviously. Um, so yeah, it's an, it's an unfortunate incident that, that he's become a victim, but you know he's kind of out there uh, being one of the good guys, and sometimes the bad guys take swats at the, the good guys, so to speak. Well, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I found interesting about the, the first article he wrote was that he actually warned the police that this may happen, and um, 
because he was uh, he he frequented a forum uh, in which they talked about this concept of swatting people, and they do it at at to people they don't like essentially. And uh, he actually warned the police uh, that this may happen, but you know the police are going to respond to this incident as if something was happening. And I think you know it's respond, make sure everything's okay, and then. Um, then kind of, kind of, once you realize things are not what they seem, then you can kind of say, oh, okay, well, this isn't, this isn't true. Yeah, and I think Brian mentioned that in his article as well. He said he pretty much knew immediately what had happened. He said, but that wasn't the time to argue. You know, you put your hands in the air and you do as you're told and you tell your story when you get a chance to. Um, so yeah, um, I was just curious, have you guys, had you heard of this before? Do you know of you know others that have experienced this? Is this a you know is this becoming a, a fairly common thing? I know it was mentioned. Um, uh, Brian mentioned in his blog post that um, it kind of started on the west coast and was spreading east. Um, just curious, have you guys heard of anyone going through this? I haven't. I haven't either. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I guess it's something to be aware of. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't sound like there's much you can really do to um, protect yourself from something like this happening because uh, phone numbers can be so easily spoofed. Um, it can look like uh, a call is coming from a legitimate number, and I don't think the authorities have the infrastructure to really be able to determine uh, whether or not the, the phone call is valid. And I don't think we can ask them to take precious minutes if something real were happening and say, well, let's try to track this down. Let's spend 10, 15 minutes debugging it. Uh, they really do need to just be able to respond and, and act because if, it, if it's a real, uh, if something real is going on, they, they can't waste that time. So uh, it's, um, I don't know. I thought it was pretty scary. I don't know, you know, if, you know, if folks can be tracked down to this, you know, what kind of uh, punishment they'd be facing. I don't even know exactly the extent to the law they broke, you know. It might just be kind of a slap on the hand, even if they were, even if they were caught. Well, the police did actually try to call him, which was what his phone upstairs ringing was. It was the police trying to call and, and call him and, and see if this was a real incident. And when he didn't answer, that's when they came, came out. Right. And and I unfortunately had a, a different cell phone at one time and on two occasions it it for some reason and the reasons why I still don't know, pocket dialed nine one one and I got a call back um, several times from a nine one one operator trying to find out if I was in you know, needed assistance. Um, so nobody showed up at the door, but I did have to explain to an EMS uh, you know, operator as to there's no emergency. In fact, one time I was, I was in the bathroom bathing one of my kids who was playing in the tub, and that was a little hard to explain. <laughs> it's like, no, no, child's fine. She's having fun in the tub. <laughs> but yeah, nobody showed up at least, and it was my own fault. Or rather, the phone's fault. I'm not sure how that happened, though. Well, back when you had a button buttons on your phone, you could just type 911 and it would dial. You wouldn't have to unlock your well, phone. Well, true. But I think like there's that. there's a there was an emergency mode on the phone where if you pressed some sequence of buttons for a period of time, it would dial automatically. I never did discover what that sequence was, and that's not really relevant to our conversation here. I think the point is that uh, they do try to confirm emergency calls when they can. But if you don't answer, then they assume the worst. Um, I think what what's more interesting is this is a two-prong attack, and we've talked about one of those prongs. The other prong of this attack was an online attack targeting his website, Krebs on Security. And this is a site that, that has been attacked before with denial, distributed denial of service attacks and was undergoing another attack. What was interesting this time is somebody sent an FBI letter basically accusing the site of of things that it shouldn't be doing and asked that it be taken down. His hosting company realized it was probably a hoax and kind of forwarded that on to him so he could go follow up with it. So um, not only was this a you know, physical attack on the, on the SWAT side, but also an online attack. 
Yeah, and one of the things, um, I, I think it was from his posting on March 18th, uh, like I said, he was following the trail, and he was actually able to discover uh, kind of a dump, I believe, from Booter.tw that uh, kind of showed the trail of who paid for that attack on his site. And uh, um, again, uh, Brian does preface it with, you know, this is the what he's found in the course of the investigation so far. He doesn't know how much of this is, is true or not, but it, it sounds like he ultimately ended up on the phone with potentially the hacker phobia. And, um, you know, I, I'd encourage our listeners to go look at the articles. It, it's kind of entertaining because at one point he's talking to this uh, uh, um, alleged hacker and uh, he was talking about how, um, you know, has he ever been, in, uh, you know, has he ever been involved, you know, Hacker, you know, the hacker was saying hackers have tried to swat at him. He goes, you know, talking about how annoying it is, and, and Brian's kind of like, yeah, I can kind of understand that. So uh, it's uh, it's 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 a very interesting thread uh, to to follow. Uh, I won't go into all the details here, but uh, if you get a chance, you might look at that and and see. Um, it, it sounds like. Uh, Brian is, is trying really hard to follow this all the way through and, and find out who, who's behind it all. But as we all know, that can be very difficult with, uh, with how easy it is to kind of hide your identity online. Well, Nate, one more comment. I mean, this swatting thing, uh, I, <clears throat> I think in, in some ways it started out as kind of a teenager's pr pranking friends from what I've read about it. But it is, it is actually, I mean, I, I think it's, can, it's fairly dangerous. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous thing to do. And, uh, and, you know, it could, it could lead to real, it could lead to bad situations. I mean, the police are trained to ensure that everything's okay. And if someone is, you know, anti-police or, or whatever, or they've done something else, that you know that this it could it could lead to a bad situation and then it's and it's not it's not it's not a good thing to do to anybody and uh, with voice over IP and rerouting your calls through other services and caller ID spoofing it seems like it's becoming easier and easier to pull this off and and not get caught. Yes, I, I would agree. I think it's uh, a of. of very dangerous thing to uh, pull off. I don't know. Uh, again, I had not heard much of it before this. So I don't know if if it's ever gone gone south. But it's not hard to imagine. Um, you know, someone open. You know, someone having a bad day, opening the door. Maybe they are. Maybe they carry a gun legally. You know, so they've got a gun. You know, in a holster. You know, they open the door and and you know, or, or the police kick in the door and they draw their weapon. I mean, what are the police going to do? You know, it, it's going to end in violence. Um, you know, and someone probably being killed. And it wouldn't need to come to that. Um, so I, I I think it's a very dangerous thing. And um, hopefully, as it as it garners more attention, uh, folks can be be aware of it. I, I guess uh, you know the only piece we've mentioned that maybe could have helped Brian avoid this was if he would have been able to answer his phone at that moment. And I understand why he couldn't answer his phone at that moment, but uh, maybe we, you know, maybe when we hear our phone ring, we need to make sure we pick it up <laughs> just in case someone on the other end of the line is uh, uh, trying to confirm we are who we are and that we're not in danger. All right, well, I'll uh, move on to the next article, and this one's uh, mine. And this is kind of in the opposite, kind of the opposite um, frame. Uh, this is a, uh, <coughs> a Reuters journalist uh, was indicted by a federal uh, grand jury for handing over his login credentials of his former employer, uh, which is the uh, Tribune, uh, to... Uh, a hacker, the hacker movement anonymous. So unlike the previous one where a journalist was targeted by hackers, this is a journalist who was essentially assisting hackers in hacking his uh, former employer. And um, he has been, I think, suspended uh, from, from uh, his job without pay. And uh, he's still on trial, so this is all alleged that he did this. Um, but I think this is a very bad thing for a journalist to do, and uh, 
it raises a lot of questions on, you know, obviously his journalistic integrity and all that, but it also raises questions on why was his credentials from his former employer allowed to access uh, the network and actually make changes to their websites and things like that? Why why would why would his why would his credentials even allow access to his former employer and things like that? And when what the hacker was able to do is deface some sites, add content, and and basically do some do some malicious things at the Tribune. So it raises a lot of questions from a journalistic perspective on on that and it also raises questions from his former employer on why was this even allowed to to happen. Yeah and I think uh, one of the things that's not clear from the article um, and I kind of read through the comments to go with it as well to try to understand is the timing of events because that came up a lot in the comments and that was my first thought why would the Tribune not pull his credentials but based on the timing of events it may be that he handed over the credentials while he was still employed by by the Tribune so he may have been an active employee at the time that the uh, credentials were turned over and the defacement occurred it wasn't obvious to me whether or not he did that as a disgrunt as an active disgruntled employee or whether he did it after he left that position um, so I, I think there's a little bit of uh, ambigu ambiguity ugh. there's a little bit of confusion there as far as um, what the timing of events were and and I just also wanted to point out uh, he was he was suspended but uh, he was suspended with pay, actually. So uh, at least for now, he's he's still getting paid from his employer. Though I would have to imagine that if he's found guilty, he's going to be without employment and, and facing a whole other world of problems. It seems that he um, went on an IRC channel, and and this IRC channel was known uh, location for. Uh, various people to hang out and basically not only did he pass along credentials it allegedly says that he encouraged them to go mess stuff up and I'm gonna use the polite terms so um, not only did he provide information he also provided encouragement perhaps so motivation here is a big question um, what I didn't see is that there was any actual damage done uh, and I'm not seeing that. Does anybody know if that actually happened? Somebody used his information? Uh, yeah, I think uh, articles did get changed. Uh, according to this, there, was, there, was, there were articles on the website that did actually get changed and modified. Um, I don't know what level what level of damage that was, but um, okay, it does. Yeah, yeah it, it does say that the a Los Angeles Times news story had its headlines changed, byline and subheadline to include the name Chippy thirteen thirty seven. Also, a line in the article was changed to read. Uh, I'm just looking at this. Oh. Yeah, probably some language I shouldn't share, but it, it definitely was changed. Uh, Chippy1337 takes his rightful place as head of the Senate, and then some stuff I probably shouldn't say. So it, it was, uh, there were some things that were changed. Hmm. Interesting. Well, uh, yeah, so going back to uh, Preston's original question, why weren't his credentials changed when he left the employment? It sounds to me like the company did not follow what we would consider best practices when somebody is dismissed from a, a job, whether they're terminated or they retire or they just leave the company. I mean, you know, that's when you've got to go back and, and change uh, access permissions and change passwords or whatever, delete accounts if necessary. And apparently that didn't get done. Yeah, that that's true. I mean, this this goes for for every for pretty much everyone who has credentials. Every company uh, should ensure they do this, and because not all employees leave companies happy, and uh, so you 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 want to. I mean, it's probably the simplest uh, and most basic thing you can do pr to protect yourself is to revoke. Uh, 
uh, uh, former employees access to your uh, resources. Yes, it, and it also sounds like um, that he uh, allegedly tried to uh, regain access for the hacker when the uh, system administrators were, were fighting off the hacker. So, I, you know, uh, it's important that you change those credentials, but you also uh, close up any loose ends because maybe he had multiple accounts or he still had an avenue into the system where he could get another access to another account. Um, so th that to me always seems to be the tricky part. There's the there's the major IDs and logins we think of, you know, the, the basic ones, but then there might be alternate ones that employees are issued. You need to make sure that they're all changed and locked and and uh, uh, locked down and, and deleted so that uh, former employees can't get in under any of those. Because it sounds like this uh, it sounds like he had multiple avenues of getting into the tribunes systems and, and maybe they weren't all shut down uh, at his departure. Okay, and uh, with that we'll wrap it up. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Mike Hill and Keith Watson. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.